The design of foundations is arguably one of the most critical aspects to your structural design because it can either make or break your building. You can either throw too much money at the foundations, meaning you do not have enough money to complete the project, or not enough, meaning the building will move and crack. And foundations come in a variety of forms, so it's important that you understand the benefits and drawbacks of each of them and when you should choose one over the other. So I'll be going through all of these, allowing you to make that critical design decision. My name's Brennan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Before we go into detail about the different types of foundation systems, it's important to understand the type of soil and substructures that you may be founding on. This is either a clay, a silt, a sand, a gravel, or a rock. The soil that you're going to be founding on will likely dictate the type of foundation system that you would choose as the different founding materials will behave differently under different loadings and different conditions. So before you start any project, it's important that you get the geotechnical engineer out to site to investigate, to look at what the founding material is underneath and how it's likely to behave. The subsoil structure will not only vary between your different locations, but it can also vary across site if you've got a large building. So you may have one type of soil on one side and a varying material on the other. So it's important that you test the whole site. The subsoil structure is likely to be a combination of the primary soil types, and these come in a number of different forms. So you either have your clays, which is a sticky, expansive material, which you can get some quite high bearing capacities out of. But once it gets wet, it will swell up and move. So your foundations need to consider the expansion and contraction of a clayey material. Or you could have your silt, which is still a little bit sticky. It's a little bit softer though. It does expand and contract, but it has generally really poor bearing capacity. Then you can move into your gravels and sand, which is more of a coarse material. They don't really behave that poorly when they get wet. They may have a poor bearing capacity. As you press down, the soil particles may move away. The other problem of a coarse or sandy material, they can be subject to a liquid faction event. Now I've done this in previous videos, but when it gets wet and you shake that material, the soil can turn into more of a liquid, sinking the building into the ground. And of course, the best material that you can possibly get is that rock. Now rock is really solid, so it has generally a high bearing capacity. So generally, if you're founding on a rock system, you'll likely have the most cheapest footings. But you do need to be careful about the rock as it could be either very fracturous, so when you put it on, there could be a lot of movement. But you can also get a variety of strengths. You can have your soft sandstones all the way up to your hard basalts. Wherever possible, you wanna be trying to found into that rock as it'll be the most stable and have the highest bearing capacity. Then typically sand is your next cheapest as it doesn't have that contraction and expansion you can still achieve a relatively high bearing capacity. Silts are generally your worst as they have that soft material. So typically you'll need some sort of piling system. Then clays just need a really stiff footing system as you can get a high bearing capacity, but it can well and contract under even just normal moisture differentials from seasonal movements. Much like the footings bearing down on the soil, don't forget to bear down on that like button. Not only does it help my channel out, but also allows this channel to get out to more people. So what's the other things that you need to consider when you're looking at your foundation design? We just talked about earlier about how stiff your footing system needs to be. So if you've got a highly expansive and contractive soil, the footing system needs to account for that movement and be stiff enough that it doesn't break under those seasonal movements. You can also have different soft spots across your soil system. So if you've got certain spots in areas, you may need to span across them. So the footing system may need to span across the soft spots to get to the solid material on either side. Another careful consideration when looking at your footings, sometimes you may have a varying height as you may either have a basement or a sloping block. And soils do have an angle of repose. So the angle at which they generally want to slope at. And if you go beyond that angle of repose, you're typically undermining the footing system. So this footing up here can't bear on the soil underneath it has essentially lost its bearing capacity. So if you are undermining it, the footing system needs to cope for that area which you've undermined so we can go to the more solid foundation system further away. Any foundation design is governed by the allowable bearing capacity. And this allowable bearing capacity is calculated based on the allowable settlement of the structure. As we know from Newton's first law, any action has an equal and opposite reaction. When load goes onto the ground, it will settle to some extent. And the bearing capacity is based on this allowable settlement. So depending on how big or small a load you can have, that allowable bearing capacity that you get is based on the allowable settlement of the structure. Now I've gone through some of the things that you need to consider before even getting into the selection of your footing systems. What type of foundation systems do you have available to you? So you can either have a shallow foundation system, which is more like your pad footings, strip footings or rafts, or you can have a deep foundation system, which is either your driven piles, screw piles, or pile foundations. Now you may have a combination of these in your project, but typically you don't want to mix different founding materials. So you don't want to have shallow foundations mixed with deep foundations, as the deep foundations will move less, potentially causing a differential settlement problem. 
So if you're founding on one type of foundation system, you wanna make sure that you're picking one or the other or having it such that that differential movement will not cause issues to your structure. So what are the benefits and drawbacks of using either a shallow or a deep foundation system? Cause surely the deep foundation system is better. Well, no, because you're gonna spend more money potentially when you don't need to. Where the shallow foundation system is normally your cheaper option. So wherever possible, you wanna try and pick that shallow foundation system if your structure can cope with it. So what is the benefits of using a shallow foundation system? As we were saying, it's typically cheaper. It's easy to build as you just need to dig down and bear on the soil below it. The other problems is potentially you will get a lot more settlement. It will be more subject to those seasonal movements. It can potentially be undermined by either adjacent structures that need to get built earlier or after, or if you've got deeper areas. So if you've got one area that's founded on one location and you have a shallow foundation system close to it, this may cause a problem. The other issue, as we were saying before, was that liquefaction. So your shallow foundation systems are typically subject to that liquefaction problem. So if you're in the wrong area, you may need to put piles down, not only just for the bearing capacity, but for its capacity underneath an earthquake and that liquefaction event. Where you want to use your deep foundation systems is if you've got loads that are way too high. For example, if you've got a high load from a building coming over and there's not enough bearing capacity in the subsoil structure that you'd be founding on, you may put piles down to the bedrock below. If you've got uplift problems, so if you've got a really high wind uplift and need a lot more mass in it, a pile can be quite a good option to tie down that building. Or if you've got really poor foundation systems, such as that silt, so if you're founding on silt, typically you will need some sort of piling foundation to get below the silt and onto the better bearing capacity below. Now the drawbacks of the piling foundation system, it is longer to build as you need to install the piles, there's a certain trade that you need to bring in. And typically when you're installing your piles, you're still installing them with some sort of pad footing or strip footing to spread the footings around. So you not only do you need that same foundation system you've got on your shallow foundation system, but you also got the pile structure integrated in your design as well. But really where it shines is it's not subject to much of that seasonal movement as you can drill the piles down deep enough. So it's not subject to that moisture change. Again, if you've got that really poor foundation system, you may need to choose it. Or if you know there's gonna be a future development next to you, potentially when they dig down and move the soil away, they'll either draw down the water table so that deep foundation system won't be affected from that future development or potentially undermining it. If you've got a shallow foundation system, you've got the building next to you, you dig down, they haven't undermined your footing. So it's just some things you need to consider when choosing either a deep or a shallow foundation system. So what are the different types of shallow foundations that you have available to you? So you either have that pad footing, which is your most common type. Now pad footing is just an isolated pad, typically with a point load from a column over the top. That pad footing is sized based on that nominal load that you need to spread it over. So based on the allowable bearing capacity from the geotechnical engineer, then you just need to design the load for that strut and tie action to allow that load over to spread across the area underneath it. Some things that you need to consider when looking at that pad footing. Does it spread out at the right angle? And what is that tie capacity in the bottom of your pad? Have you spread the load far enough to get to that allowable bearing capacity? And what a lot of people often miss as well is the pad footing actually is adding weight to the soil. So if you've got a shallow building, the pad footing would be quite significant to the load that it's applying to the soil as well. So not only do you need to consider the load over, but also the self weight of the footing system itself. So you can also have pad footings that may need to be rectangular in form. For example, if you've got a column up and it needs to resist lateral actions, the footings needs to have enough weight in it to counterbalance that movement, but also spread out the load to make sure it's not too concentrated. The next type of foundation system and likely the second most common footing system that you're likely to encounter is a spread footing or a strip footing. A spread footing is typically just a, a beam that's cast into the ground along a long length. This can either support line loads from walls over as it will spread the load across that length. If you've got differential movements and you need to tie things together, you generally have that beam and it'll typically balance out the movement in the structure. Those strip footings are also really good as if you've got a, a frame that you need to resist overturning as you can have the beam connecting to balance out those forces. So a variety of different purposes that you can use your strip footing system for. The other benefit of having strip footing is if you've got surfaces cast into the ground or soft spots. So typically surfaces can't take a lot of load from the structure over the top. So you need some way of spreading over those locations. It's also good for going over soft spots. So you've got soft material in between and the footings need to span over it. The foundation can be designed to span over that soft spot and go to where the good material is. The other one is a big raft system. So for example, if you've got a really big towering structure above you and you need to put the loads onto their single footing system. So you typically have multiple walls or multiple columns. The raft is typically a lot bigger covering a whole core, for example. So you've got a core structure coming down that has big overturning moments and movements that it may need to resist. Typically they're quite deep to get enough mass in them to resist those overturning loads. It can also help with differential movement because if you've got a 
big, big raft system and multiple point loads on them, the system will act as one as opposed to just isolated pads. Or if you've got soft spots and you don't know potentially where they're going to be, so the raft can span in whatever direction it needs to to get to the correct bounding material. You may also have a slab integrated in your design. So you can have things such as waffle pods, which is really stiff. So in that highly reactive soil, the waffle pod can move up and down and be quite effective at resisting those actions. Or typically the most common one, especially here in Australia, is that stiffened raft. So you'll have edge beams around the outside and ridge beams internally to not only stiffen up the slab, so when it does get that differential movement, there's enough stiffness in the slab to stop it. The other really good thing about that stiffened raft and with those edge beams is that you can modify it based on the soil type that you have. So if you've got a really good soil such as the sand, you're likely to have minimal to no footings internally, where if you've got a really highly movable soil like a clay, you can add more footings into the system, stiffening it up. What are the different types of deep foundations that you have available to you? So just say you've got really poor founding material, so you need to go down deeper. Highly reactive soil that the building can't cope with, so you need to make sure the structure is stiffer, or your loads are potentially just too high. The different types of founding material, I'll start with the most easiest one first, which is your screw pile. A screw pile is essentially just a bit of steel with a propeller on the bottom that's screwed into the ground. So you can screw this down as deep as you can go. So it's quite easy and quick to install as you essentially just get a machine, drill it into the ground. And as soon as it's in place, it's ready to bear the material over. You can also calibrate it based on the load that you need. So you, sometimes you may need to go to a certain depth to get below the silt, but also based on the amount of torque that you need to apply to it will be the given bearing capacity that you achieve out of each of those screw piles. Sometimes you can just integrate them. Say you've got a timber floor, you can just screw the screw pile into the ground and directly bear on top of it. But other times you may screw it a little bit further and either put a pad footing or strip footings underneath. Now, of course, the footing system does get more expensive here as typically the footing system needs a design to span between these different piling systems. It doesn't matter which one you choose, the footing system is suspended as it's bearing on these foundations that are a lot stiffer and a lot further apart. So not only do you need to pay for the foundations that are in the ground, so that the screw piles or the piles, but you also need to pay for the increase in your the stiffness of your structure over and allowing it to span between the supports. Another type of foundation system that is very similar to that screw pile is that driven pile. So essentially you have a hardened pile that's typically made up of a precast that will then be hammered into the ground. So as soon as you, you hammer it into the ground to the correct depth, it's ready to be loaded. Now the problem with this type of system is this impaction and concussion to get the footing system into the ground potentially requires a bigger system with a lot of weight on top of it, potentially shakes the buildings around it. As you can see, big hammering motions banging into the ground that may vibrate the structure around it, that may cause problems for local residents. But typically it is better and quicker to build as it's already activated as soon as you've pushed it into the ground. The next type of foundation system you'll see quite a lot around Australia and is that board pile or CFA piles. So essentially they get a big drilling rig out on site. So if you've ever seen those big constructions with those big drills, they're drilling into the ground a hole. And then what they do is then cast concrete into the ground that allows it to bear on the soil underneath. So there's a number of different ways that this footing board pier or that driven pile may act. As you can see, it's drilled into the pile. You do have bearing at a lot lower level. So you may drill all the way down to the bedrock, then bear on the bedrock underneath, meaning you've got a really high bearing capacity. But as you go up, the pile also has side walls and you can have side friction on them. So as the load goes up onto that piling system, it not only does it load up the bearing capacity underneath, but also there's a friction on the side that can help resist those loads as it's getting pressed into the soil. So depending on your subsoil structure, you may have not only bearing capacity on your pile, whether it be driven or drilled, but you can also have that skin friction on the side that can greatly increase your bearing capacity. One problem you may encounter sometimes with those piling foundation systems in the wrong materials, as you're bearing down, the movements and seasonal movements may cause the pile to be pulled further and further into the ground. It was like a suction force. But talking to a geotechnical engineer, you'll be able to consider these careful considerations. Now, whether you're choosing that driven pile, your drill pile or your screw pile, you may also incorporate this with a big raft. For example, we're talking about raft four, which is a big footing to spread the loads out. You may incorporate piles into your raft design. For example, if that footing system can't resist the loads because it has too high bearing capacity, still have your giant raft, but you can have a piled raft. Are there any other types of foundation systems that you quite often see that I've missed? Please comment below. And I've got links on my Patreon in the below description if you wish to support the channel further, much like the many Patreons across here. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.